Welcome to Residential Tech Talks. I'm Jeremy Glowacki, Executive Editor of Residential Tech Today. This week, Ryan McDaniel joins us from Westfield, Indiana, where he is president of the custom integration firm OneTouch Automation. Ryan and I are often at the same industry events, whether right here in central Indiana or out of state, such as the recent ASEAN Unlimited conference in Nashville. I've had my magazine headshot photographed at his previous showroom location here in Carmel, Indiana, and was recently welcomed into his new, more extensive demonstration space in Westfield, which includes a really beautiful second floor dedicated home theater featuring a Star Trek style sliding door. I learned just last week that Ryan had earned his American Lighting Association Lighting Specialist Certification, so I decided it was time to have him on the podcast and talk about how he is rounding out his technical chops with more lighting design know-how and what observations he's had over the past year in residential technology. Ryan McDaniel, thanks for joining me today on the podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. I've always enjoyed talking to you over the years, and when I saw that post about your ALA lighting specialist certification, I I knew that was something I wanted to follow up with you um, on. And before we get to that particular discussion, though, I I did have another important question for you. We're Facebook friends, and I couldn't help but notice that you're a big fan of live music. So my question for you is, if you had to pick just one band to listen to while stranded on a desert island, which would you choose? The Grateful Dead or Fish? Oh, wow. That is a, a big choice right there. Um, I love both bands. I go to um, quite a few Fish shows uh, recently. Uh, and uh, But The Grateful Dead is definitely my all-time favorite. Um, as I'm driving around uh, this town, it's, it's the dead in my car probably 75% of the time. Uh, fish, the other part. Now you have to explain to me because I'm I'm not a, a jam band guy. Uh, I love music too, and and I and I do enjoy um, a lot of different styles of music. But the folks who are just so into both the Dead and Fish, um, I is it something that gets into your into your soul at a certain point in your life and you just can't shake it? Is it, ex- is it the live experience that happens? I've talked to people who have never even seen the dead perform um, or, or a version of the dead perform, and they still have that passionate following, that thing that they just have to listen to dead so much. Um, but then I've talked to people that say it's all about that, that sort of culture and that, um, the community when you get there of these different types of these two particular bands. What what is it for you that really seems to be the draw for for the those two bands and maybe the dad in particular? The culture and community is definitely a big part of it, especially in my younger years, um, going from show to show and and hanging out with the same people night after night. Uh, that community is is pretty tight, um, but as time progresses, uh, that doesn't happen as much. And um, it's really, it digs deep in your soul because it's really the creativity of the band. They could take a song and then just go somewhere completely different. And then the next night go somewhere else. Um, To have that catalog of songs they can choose from and just at that moment, choose what they want to play. It's very inspiring and, and just love the creativity they come up with. Now, are you a musical guy as well? Do you play an instrument? Um, so I just recently started playing guitar, trying to uh, learn how to play guitar. That came about probably six years ago now as my son wanted to play guitar. So as he went to practice and, and um, got lessons, I would have him come home and teach me what he learned. Um, just one, to reinforce what he was learning, but two, because I really wanted to learn how to play as well. So, um, so, it's, so, yeah, so it's really I'm, just I'm the love of the, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I mean, that, that was just one of my other theories is mu- musicians love to listen to, you know, music that, you know, kind of impro- improvisatory and all uh, that sort of thing. But, uh, the fact that you just love it for the music and you're kind of getting into playing music only recently is a totally different thing. But, uh, well, that, that gives me some insight and I, I just always have to talk to, to, to fans of those two bands about what it is that, that makes them so passionate about them. But, uh, sure. I did want to switch gears and talk about the lighting, um, certification, yeah. uh, you know, the, the traditional AV channel that we're in, 
uh, is really getting into to lighting for the first time as a as a fixture uh, installation and lighting design. Obviously, you've done lighting control, shades control, um, installing motorized shades. But uh, what what um, what kind of I know that through the buying groups, there's been a lot of uh, help there getting people motivated to take these certifications. But what convinced you that it was time for for you you to explore that and and to go through the certification? Sure. I I think with the Lumineer now just all LED based and um, the ability to control each light fixture um, individually um, and then also as groups, it really relies on people like us, integrators, to get that dialed in. Um, we're the ones that, that can put a keypad on the wall that can, when you hit a button in the living room, it can turn the light all onto the right level. Or if we wanna do color spectrum or circadian rhythm, we're the ones that have to be involved um, to make that all work. Um, we also, our project management skills, we are also the ones that can really organize lighting uh, fixtures that go in each room, specific rooms, we can lay them out. Um, we have that skill set. Uh, a lot of electricians, they like to install stuff, but they don't necessarily want to go through the ins and outs of all the, the finer details that, that we're actually pretty good at. So, so um, yeah, lighting was the fixture side of it, becoming certified to be smart in the room when we're talking about what fixture goes where and why. Um, it was important for our company, for me to become ALA certified um, and start down that training path. So is this first step for that? Um, do, are there other uh, stages of certification after this that you want to uh, explore? I think uh, for initially, I'll, I'll start using this certification um, to start having those intelligent conversations with our builder partners, with our architect partners, um, with end users um, and with clients. Um, and see where that takes me. Um, definitely probably go to a next level at some point. And what did you find as the um, preparation for the certification test was like? Did you uh, have to do a lot of reading, a lot of uh, um, like online training courses? What was that all about? Yeah, so the training was a, uh, it ended up being a 16 hour training. Um, and it was all online. So they send you a training book that was about four inches uh, thick and um, they would do a, a two hour session. You would have time in between uh, to read material in the book, take pre-exams, and then you'd have a two hour session in the afternoon. So that went for four sessions. And then after that was the exam. The exam was a two hour timed exam. Um, where you had a hundred and some questions and you had to get 80% or more uh, to pass. And was it the type of thing that you felt that um, is a good fit based on how, how that experience went for folks who have the type of experience you had and in, in mostly, I guess, AV and control and that sort of stuff. Um, did it come somewhat naturally the, the learning part of this? To get to the the learning came really natural only because I've been doing uh, Lutron homework since 2002. So okay. um, I've been so involved in lighting for uh, the past 19 years that um, the verbiage they used, it, it all made sense and was natural. The first two hour session in training, I was really nervous. I was like, what did I get myself into? Because it was really basic stuff and it was talking oh. about CFLs and incandescents and halogens. And I was like, oh my gosh, this has nothing to do with the world we're in. Um, okay. But that was a nice transition onward. And, and you learn quite a bit that the teaching uh, was very well done. Okay, very good. Well, let's talk about this new um, real estate that you have in Westfield. This, sure. uh, this you, you, we, we've, uh, I've been there, which is a great luxury for me because I don't get out on the road and see everyone's demo spaces and showrooms uh, in person. I sometimes I'm privileged if I'm at an event and someone works nearby, we go do a little road trip. But to be up the street from me, to have me in there and then see what what, what you're up to, it was, it was really cool. And it was nice to see where you'd come from with the smaller uh, space. So maybe you could talk about what you had there in Carmel at the design center first and, and what the point, uh, what the objective of that style of space had been. And then 
you know, the inspiration to upgrade to something bigger and more like whole home. Sure, absolutely. So um, for 10 years, we were, we had a small studio. It was about 400 square feet in a, the Indiana Design Center. It was one room that we split up into kind of a, like a living room bar um, area. So clients could come in, sit on the couch and have a full automation experience. They could see the audio video. They could see lighting control. They could see automated shades. Um, they could get the full experience. But it was just a small room. Um, uh, we were giving the small ex or the big experience, but in a small space. But what we always lacked was that home cinema. So uh, we felt that uh, a theater, a well-executed theater is a, a great way for uh, audio video conversation to happen. And uh, we were really looking for a space to be able to do that. Uh, when COVID hit, we didn't use the design center, our showroom for 10 months. Uh, there was zero traffic through it. And I was saying, why are we spending the money on that? Um, let's buy a place. So uh, we had an opportunity in our city of Westfield to uh, buy the house next to our office. Mm. And um, so I bought that house and we were able to transform that into a full demo experience. So now when people come in, um, they, can, they can experience the house as if they were going to live there. Um, so the inspiration was more to give a full encompassing experience. Um, now we can walk them through all the different rooms and how they would live with a system and, and exactly what the AV guy does. Since we do so much more than just audio video, we're, we're controlling light fixtures, we're, we're uh, controlling shades, temperature, um, awesome experiences like a home theater or a two channel stereo room. Um, so we can give that full experience to a client um, as if it was their own home. And then we can walk them right next door and show them how our operations work. So they can see uh, our office manager. They can meet our office manager. They can, they can meet our sales engineers. They can meet uh, our operations team. Um, so it's, it's really nice to have that all together now instead of driving across town to do a, a quick demo at the experience or at the design center. We can now give a full experience, bring them over, meet the team, um, and show them that we're a legit company that that wants to do business with them. Yeah. So um, walk us through some of the technology that you have in their specific brands and that sort of thing. I remember Kaleidoscape being a big part of the the content source for the home theater, and and I believe you told me that was the first time you'd worked with Kaleidoscape, correct? Yeah, correct. Um, we. We got on board with Clydescape a little earlier on, but then as the lawsuit and everything went through, we, we just kind of stepped away for a while, but we're, we're back with Clydescape. And now everybody who comes through the theater um, doing demos with Clydescape, there's only one source to do that with. And now it's so easy to sell a, you know, a premium source uh, when people are experiencing that. Um, they, they see how easy it is. They just absolutely fall in love with it as we did. Uh, but in terms of brands um, in that whole building, we have been a savant dealer since 2009. Actually, I think our, my first conference is where I met you for the first time. We were That's sharing right. a limo uh, from Boston. <laughs> yes, we're cool. We're limo guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, in Boston traffic. Um, yeah. And uh, so savant, uh, um, a savant system goes into every project we do. Um, so uh, savant. Um, kind of drives the control side of the experience house. Um, but we're also Lutron um, folks. We have been with Lutron since 2002. Um, so um, all the lighted control over there and shades are, are Lutron. Um, the uh, home cinema, we were able to team up with a local audio uh, company called Accurus. Um, so we teamed up with Rick Santiago and his, his crew. They supply or it's their uh, pre-amplifier and amplifiers that are driving the audio experience over there. And it's, uh, it's unbelievable how awesome it sounds and that they're in our backyard. Uh, Rick, the owner of um, Indie Audio Labs, who makes the Acuris, um, lives 10 minutes from me. Um, and um, when he comes over to the theater, it's, it's, it's a joy because uh, he's making the product and, um, and lives right around the corner. Um, so we, we used uh, Accurus for the um, processing and then uh, Barco um, 
for the projection um, Kaleidoscape as, as the primary source um, over there. And then we also teamed up with Oralex, which is a local acoustic company here in town. Uh, Dave Pedigo, many people in our industry knows, um, he runs uh, Oralex over there and his yep. team came over and supplied the um, acoustic treatment. Um, so it was real fun to see um, see them at work and, and putting all, all their stuff together. Um, yeah, some really nice local connections there, really. I mean, it, uh, yeah, I it's amazing what, what we have here. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, literally, um, um, Indie Audio Labs manufactures in southern Indiana. It's not even like they just do design work here. They they build in the state. So um, right. that's pre pretty awesome. Um, what about that door? Um, the door. sliding door was pretty cool. So um, a big concept of, uh, of ours is if we think of the network of our clients, um, if you boil that down to an hourly rate and think of how much they make per hour, we feel it's important to give them experience worth their time. So if it was just, if we just did a subpar theater um, with a normal door, uh, it's some experience they could have at any shop around town. So we wanted to blow people away. Um, so we used a future automation piece, it's an automated door. Um, and um, when you sit down in the theater chairs and, and you start a movie, then the door automatically closes. Um, and it's such a, a memorable experience for, for people to have when they're just like, wow, they're blown away with the door. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's the door. Very cool. And um, so it's been a debate over the years about the, the need for basically demo showrooms and big spaces and that sort of thing. And, um, I think business has been so good that you can afford to invest in a space like that. Cause you're, you're going to make it back pretty well. And it just helps you to sell so much. But how do you make the decision to go to upgrade? I, I get where owning your own real estate really is a better investment than having to rent something in a very expensive design center. Um, but is it still um, stressful to know you've got this overhead now of a bigger space like that? Or do you, do you have enough of a plan, you know, this is going to be worth taking the time and all the effort and investment in that? Sure. Yeah, there's uh, there's zero concern. I mean, owning your real estate is key. If you can buy a place and then use it to help your business um, and then you can sell it later, it's it's a very good investment. Um, in terms of having a space to show off what we do, uh, since we do so much, uh, it's really hard to convey how much we actually touch in a house, how much we actually are needed. Um, so when people come to a space that is fully automated, um, they, can, they can see it, they can feel it, they can understand uh, what it is that we do. Um, so I, I would not miss that. For anything, I would definitely show it off if you can, or or find a place to do that. Uh, also, I mean, just being able to give somebody experience. Uh, I think uh, when we opened that sh the next door showroom, um, the first client in there bought a Kaleidoscape, who's never seen Kaleidoscape before, was happy with Apple TV. Um, the next one bought a Kaleidoscape and now is doing full acoustic treatments in their theater. They can. They can see it. They can understand the importance instead of just us talking about it. Um, if they're feeling it and getting that emotion from it, that's everything. I would highly recommend it. Brian McDaniel and I will continue our conversation after the break. Do you want superior smart home automation at a great value? Shelly Wi-Fi relays by Alterco Robotics cover DC to line voltage, allowing you to control lights, outlets, appliances, garage doors, pumps, and much more. There are Shelly sensors and power measurement devices to help you measure temperature, humidity, lux, or motion, and electrical consumption from single wire to three phase with neutral. You can use Shelly with a licensed driver for Control 4, Elon, or other premium systems, as well as your customer's existing hub, voice assistant, or any platform that accepts REST, MQTT, or CoAP. 
Shelly can make IoT very easy. Available now at Blackwire, City Electric Supply, and Worthington, or at ShellyUSA.com. Welcome back. I'm Jeremy Glowacki, and I'm talking with Ryan McDaniels, president of One Touch Automation in Westfield, Indiana. Um, Ryan, you grew up in Ohio, it looks like, and went to college in Bloomington, Indiana at, at Indiana University. Is that correct? That is correct. I was born um, I was born in Indiana and then moved over to Cleveland area when I was around seven. So what brought you back? I guess you, you went to school in, at IU. Then did, uh, how did you end up settling in central Indiana um, to, to Good question. after school? So after uh, school was done, I moved to Michigan for a couple of years. My wife and I, uh, Rachel, moved to Michigan, um, worked a couple of years in Michigan and moved out west to Colorado. Um, out in Colorado, uh, Denver area is where I learned this trade. Um, mm. I always had a passion for AV growing up. Um, I did a lot of car audio stuff um, in okay. Cleveland. Um, always had a passion for it. I didn't go to school for business or anything like that. I went to school for outdoor recreation and resource management. Okay. So I moved out to Colorado with the hopes I would do something out there in, in that field. Uh, everybody else moves to Colorado with the same hope. And um, uh, without a job, I was looking for, um, for anything. And mm -hmm. my dad at the same time in Lafayette had his house pre-wired with all this Cat5 uh, running to a central closet. I thought, what are you doing? That is awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that was back in 2000. And, um, and he was telling me about smart homes and, and the future. And uh, I ended up calling um, one of the, what I found was four companies out there that did smart homes and uh, said I was a hard worker. I was a quick learner, uh, but I knew nothing and, and wanted to learn and, and I would work hard for them. So uh, company vision systems, Ron Winnie and Jeff Kirkham hired me out there. Um, I learned the trade uh, and uh, moved back to Indiana um, in 2006 when Rachel and I wanted to start our family. We wanted to okay. be around our family. Uh, sure and raise kids here in the Midwest. You came back around the same time I did for the same reason. So I get it. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, that, that was something that I observed about you. You guys, um, a lot of your photos are, are camp kind of oriented, uh, outdoor type stuff. And, um, it, it just, it seems sort of, it's not like it's not something you can do to work at, uh, inside technology trade, so to speak, and then also be an outdoors type of person. So it's kind of, kind of cool the way you balance those two things. Um, cause, cause I don't know the, the idea of the home, home theater with the, the enclosed space, it's the opposite of the outdoor open world, you know? Um, yeah. so it probably gives you a chance just to, to, to have a balance there probably doing both of those things. Right. Absolutely. Well, the business in general gives me a good balance because it gives me a challenge every day. I mean, I didn't go to business school. I, I mean, there is no book written for me to read to, to actually understand how to run an AB tech company. Um, yeah. So the daily challenge um, of that is, is very, I love it. I love uh, that challenge. Um, and then the out, outdoors really centers me. It, it really, um, everybody needs something to not think of what they do at work. So if you can find anything in the world that just makes you not think of anything at that moment, um, that's a good thing. And outdoors does that for me. Uh, and you also seem, uh, I've seen you working on cars and pictures. And so it's kind of funny when you look at social media and it's like, this is who this person is. He does car, car repair too. <laughs> but you funny. have an old VW bus. Is that what it is that you work on? Yeah. So um, that was more of a COVID purchase. So I've always... Uh, well, following fish and the dead, it that goes hand in hand. But um, I've always uh, dreamt of owning a VW bus. And uh, during COVID, we, uh, my wife and I, uh, were driving, driving and saw this VW bus. It was a 1974, and it was uh, just totally redone and beautiful. We drove by it right when they pulled it out and put it for sale, and and we bought it. Uh, wow! And that was just a, a dream item that we. Uh, we've always wanted in terms of working on cars i used to uh work on my jeep quite a bit i okay. i do love to off-road and and take that the jeep everywhere and uh that requires a lot of work on the jeep after you get back so <laughs> got it okay that makes sense then 
Well, the other place where we we cross paths, like I mentioned before, is ASEAN, um, being a buying group, uh, I guess Smart Home Association, as it's officially known. Uh, now you're a member of the board there. And uh, I just wondered, for those who don't um, have a membership in a buying group, why do you think it's important? Um, what do you get out of it? Uh, how, how did you get convinced to join? Um, just get uh, a little background yeah, on um, that. So in 2015, uh, I was in Dallas at a Savant conference, uh, one of the Savant uh, summits, and I was asked by Savant to give a talk to the full dealer group on um, the transition from their original app to this new Savant Pro app uh, and and the benefits of it. Because a lot of people were holding on to the old True Control app and they were like, uh, why is there a new app? That, doesn't make any sense. We want we want the old one. Um, so after I gave uh, that talk, I was approached by uh, Rachel Richard Glikes with uh, Azione, and he said people reacted really well to you. We want you part of our group. Hmm. And that's in 2015, and that's when I uh, joined Azione. Um, joining a buying group, people come for the program. So. Uh, you're a much bigger company uh, if you're buying as a group than you are individually. So you get better programs. So people come for the uh, programs, but they stay because of um, the friendships they create, the knowledge they gain. Every conference we go to, um, you're surrounded by dealers that are just like you. And um, they're all experiencing the same things you're experiencing, and you can help each other through it. So if somebody um, has better project management software, they'll share it and they'll say, hey, check this out. This works so much better for me. So um, it's so nice at your fingertips. Um, you can ask, uh, like right now on Slack, if I wanted to ask a question, I have 1,100 people that will read that question and respond. Mm -hmm. um, without being a part of a buying group, you really don't have uh, that kind of interaction with peers in our industry. Uh, Cedia does a, a decent job, but that's once a year you get get together at Expo and and um, you can ask questions. But but it's not as a relaxing feel, I think, as as getting together with um, 200 and some of your closest dealer buddies. Yeah, it, it it took me a minute to warm up to the whole idea. I I'm I'm a a quiet guy, and going to events is kind of hard for me, but as you go to those, even though I go to more than just as own, each one has its own personality and, and you see that peer to peer networking occur. And that's just such a big, important thing in our industry to have. And, and I, and I see those, the benefits of that. I get a lot out of it as a, as a editor writer to learn about what you guys are doing too, as I listen to your conversations. So I, I could, I could definitely see it being beneficial for you. Um, what have it been some of your observations over the past year or so in terms of technology trends? You obviously are doing the lighting thing, which is a big one that we, we talk about. Um, I'm hearing that because of um, the stay at home nature of the pandemic that folks have been re-engaging with the idea of a dedicated home theater again in certain cases. Obviously, outdoor spaces have become more important than ever um, to have entertainment in them. Uh, are you observing some of those trends or anything else that I haven't mentioned? Yeah, I think the uh, on the onset, um, I think the biggest thing everybody attacked right away was the network, um, sure. just having a bomb-proof network um, for all the remote learning that had to happen, um, and then relied on... Um, us for a lot of the entertainment purposes, like you mentioned, uh, outdoor spaces. Everybody's confined, so they want they want to be able to to definitely entertain themselves. Um, uh, this year, uh, I think a big I would say the biggest growing trend was uh, people are more more than ever willing to look at performance. Um, so two channel audio is on its way back. High end theaters are on their way back. Um, People want performance. They're stuck at home. They want they want it good. Um, mm -hmm. They also they're not going to resorts right now, or they weren't. Now they are again. Um, but that resort living, LED strip lights, like under staircases, outside, everywhere, um, all that stuff is really important. You want to feel feel that while you're at home. And now that you're at home a lot more, it's 
makes sense to invest in your home space. Yeah, well, that's great. I, I really appreciate hearing about that and uh, confirming some of what, I, what I've learned. And uh, I, I love getting to know you a little bit better, Ryan, even though I feel like I know you pretty well. Yeah. We, we end up in so many places together. But uh, um, thanks so much for your time today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Ryan McDaniel is president of One Touch Automation in Westfield, Indiana. You can learn more about his company at onetouchautomation.com. That's one-touchautomation.com. And that wraps up today's show. If you're new to Residential Tech Talks, please subscribe to the weekly podcast and consider rating and reviewing us on your favorite platform. Also, check out all the latest residential tech news at the magazine's website, restechtoday.com where you can also subscribe to the bi-monthly print or digital magazine and to our Tuesday and Friday email newsletters. Until next time, please stay safe, stay inspired, and let us know if you have a great story to tell.